Thanks for tuning in to the Catch Podcast. Brought to you by Dark Horse Tackle. The best American small business baits you've never heard of, stocked in a monthly box. Use promo code the Catch 5 off and save $5 off your first monthly subscription to the Weekend Warrior Box. Here are your hosts, Matt Souders and Brad Hicks. Matt got his wish. Burrow out for the uh, season. <laughs> that wasn't a. I mean, it kind of was a wish. Yeah. No, I mean, dude, that was that was tough. So, watching the game last night, the reason why Brad says that is our buddy Cam is a Bengals fan. And He's only a Bengals fan because of Joe Burrow, though. He is like well, Joe, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase because yeah. he's an LSU fan. Like he doesn't yeah. really care about NFL. He's the opposite of Brad. He doesn't really care about the NFL. He cares more about the uh, NCAA. He's a big LSU fan because he's from Mississippi. Oh, I mean, or not Mississippi. Uh, uh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. I was going to say Louisville, <laughs> and I was like, that's a city. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So that's why. But it, we were texting last night before the game. And Brad came. So I'm watching the game with my wife. She's a Bengals fan. And, uh, <laughs> we're watching the game and and, <laughs> and Brad text uh, Cam. He's like, I, "You said something." All something. capital letters. What did you say? Burrow tore a ligament. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Bur- like just all caps. And Cam was like, "I'm just gonna go die." And uh, as I'll say this, as a Brown fan, I understand. Because Deshaun Watson, the Messiah, yeah, right, uh, oh, geez. tore a ligament. Now, I will say, so I'll say this. So I was, even as a Browns fan, I was with everybody earlier in the season, I was like, Deshaun's just being a girl and not playing. That second half, so he tore his something in his shoulder at, yeah. at a hit in the first half. He came out in the second half, threw 14 for 14 for like 180-some yards. That's crazy. With that tear. Yeah. And really, like, I mean, yeah, obviously the interception helped a ton to get us back in that game. But Deshaun on offense was doing a lot. He was perfect the second half of the game. Didn't miss a throw uh, with that. So, I mean, I'll take a little bit back that. That shows some toughness to me. But we, we lost him. Uh, Dude, and- at least you guys have a quarterback to lose. Like, if we lose our starting quarterback, it's just like, oh, well. Dude, I was saying this today. it sucks. <laughs> I was saying this today. Uh Pickett, I'm pretty sure he was just a fan, and they just gave him a helmet. They're like, "Hey, go play football. Uh, <laughs> Don't turn but, over the ball, and we'll be fine." But in all honesty, like we really, I mean, we have a quarterback to lose, yeah, because we have Walker, which is a practice squad, but he played okay. And yeah. then we have, you know, uh, uh, DTR, but or DR, yeah, DTR. I, I don't know. The one show in the preseason, great. In practice, I've watched, he played great. In the game he started, it was poopy. So, we'll see what happens. Uh, another Brown news. We worked out Joe Flacco this morning. I saw that. <laughs> and I everyone's like, oh, if you think that's bad, and you, still, you don't remember what Joe Flacco did to the Browns all those years. I I do remember. That was yeah, like was prime Joe 10 Flacco, years not, ago. Not 40-year-old Joe I, Flacco. <laughs> that was not 38-year-old, hasn't played a down all season. Yeah. Or really last season, Joe Flacco. Yeah. I mean, oh. now, I listen to RG3's podcast occasionally. And he just said on his podcast, he's like, I would be so down to go work for the Browns. Because what they need, they have a Super Bowl contend team, which as a Browns fan, I'm automatically going to say they do. But a lot of other people say they do. Our defense is top notch. We have the weapons. Even without Chubb, we're winning games. They need a commit like a field, somebody who can control the flow of the game. Mm-hmm. In all honesty, they need someone who can control the flow of the game and make key passes when they need to. I think RG3, I know we had him before and he was donkey poo, but he still runs, and I've seen it, he still runs a 4 3, which is, I mean, that's fast. Now, if he takes a hit, how long will that happen? Who knows? 
uh, and he can still throw the ball, but he, he has the experience. Same with Joe Flacco. Like one thing I will say, he has the experience to control the flow of a game to where he can make the on field decision, like the quick, Hey, I, I noticed something in the secondary. We need to change the play up. Uh, and it wouldn't be bad, but we'll see this Sunday. Of course, we play the the Steelers, so we'll see what happens. I oh mean, yeah, I forgot it's, about it's, that. It's 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 <laughs> our division, so I'm sure 14 players from each team is going to get like eviscerated, and two of them will die. And because yeah, we are the, we're the hardest division on our each other's teams. Just Hopefully, leave. you guys take out Pickett. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I'm just not a fan of them. It's whatever, but. I, I don't think anyone in Pittsburgh is a fan of him, bud. Yeah, there, there's some people that are still rooting for him, but I don't know. I saw yeah, something I just, today. It was, it was a meme video, and it was like an evil dark. Or it was Sauron from Lord of the Rings, or uh, or Sauruman, whatever the white wizard bad guy, and he was like over this like ball, and it said Mike Tomlin doing his dark magic to make sure he's <laughs> over five hundred percent for another yeah. season, <laughs> like with uh, Deshaun Watson and. Uh, Bro, going out. Oh, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, uh, got to give him credit though. Tomlin does a good job with great coach. Yeah, I mean he 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 does he does a lot with very little. <laughs> yeah, he does. I mean he, but he also did a lot with a really good team, like a bunch of, you know, those alpha guys who, I think, yeah. just anybody. A lot of people think coaching is easy, but when you have a lot of like uh, alpha personalities in the same room. Coaching those people aren't hard or isn't isn't easy. Like you can't yeah. just say, "Oh yeah, go out and do it," because they all want to do their own thing. Look at the Lakers uh, when they had Kobe Bryant, Dwight Howard, Steve Nash, all on the same oh, team. Yeah. yeah, we I sucked. We were yep. terrible. We were not good. It's because we didn't have a coach who can control over all of them. And Kobe was trying to coach at the same time of being Kobe Bryant. It just didn't work out. So Mike Tomlin, whether he has the doo doo poopy poop teams, or superstars like Rothensberger, Ward, you know, those guys. And he's still able to control it and consistently have winning seasons. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. he's one of the best coaches of all time. Yeah. But um I wanted to hit something else real quick before we start because this is big news. Jordan Lee jumping back into the elites. Bro, like, that was cool. huge news. Yeah. That was huge news. I wonder has he come out and said why? No, but I'm guessing it's because MLF's changing all their stuff next year. Yeah, I mean, they're, I can they're see shortening that. the field to 30 anglers or something like that. Yeah, they're they're shortening the field up. They're going back to every catch matters, I believe. Yep. Yeah, every catch matters. Which, like, I had a couple people message me and they're like, "How do you feel about that? I really don't like it." I was like, "This is how I feel about it. It's good for TV because it keeps people involved. Because every second of the of the stream or the show or the broadcast, they're catching fish and they're catching big fish. They're catching tons of fish. You go to a guy who catches 12 fish in a minute. Like yep. it's cool. It's good for TV. If you like the five fish format, the Bassmaster elite series is, a, is hard to get into for a reason. Mm -hmm. That is, Oh, it's your best five fish and all, all panoptics. Well, these guys are fishing for big money. They are the best fishermen in the world. This is, and I've said it before, MLF guys, they would destroy me. 99% of them would go out and I could go out in the same boat and I would just get whooped. But most of your bass masters that have been on the tour for a long time have skill sets that no one else has. That's mm -hmm. your triple, that's your, that's your MLB version of fishing. MLF guys float between the two. So, I mean, it's a little diluted, but still. You have your like MLB and then your triple <clears throat> A or you know semi pro leagues and stuff like that. I mean, I just think the Bassman reason there's a reason why it's a five fish limit because if you just let them go out and do unlimited catches, great for TV, but it would be dumb. Yeah, it would just I, I agree. So. And then on, on another note that, that goes along with that, the people that like separate um, Bassmaster or MLF and then they fight over it, like which one's better. That is the stupidest thing. Like, just watch well, them both. Yeah, I'm about to say, watch the them at the start. Like, watch that. It's exactly. It's two different, completely different formats. Yeah, it's cool. Tradi traditional cool. Finish fishing. They're both. I like both of them. I am more of a traditional. If I'm watching it, I want to see the five fish. I want to see 
Taku or Maddie or, mm-hmm. you know, any of them come in with big giant bags. Uh, MLF, I'm watching. I just want to see people catch fish. That's yeah. it. If I'm, if I'm watching MLF, I'm watching. I'm watching solely for the action of seeing fish get caught. If I'm watching the Bassmasters, I'm more of that suspense, traditional watch. They're both good. They both have their place, and they both – I, why would you want to fight between the two? That's dumb. I don't. I don't get it. Like people arguing about it. I'm like, there's no point. Just do people argue about everything? Who cares? Who they cares? argue about everything. It's it's that's true. It's never ending. Believe me, someone would argue the monkey butt whopper and it's so one so much better than the other. And is it? <laughs> they both work fine. You're it's yeah. stupid. So whatever. Yeah, that's the great thing about fishing is there's no right or wrong answer really. It's most of the time everything works. It's just a matter of when and what you're throwing. So yeah. That actually kind of goes with uh our show today. So that's actually a good segue to get into our show. Yeah, I'm about it. You're not wrong. I didn't even think of it that way. So <laughs> but but yeah. Uh we are bringing on Travis Myers to talk about uh, fall time and winter transition on the river. We're going to be talking about little smallmouth talk and everything. So uh, he has 40 years experience doing this. So what's up, Travis? How are you, gentlemen? Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Of, of course. Thanks for coming on, brother. Um, for the people at home who who might not know our kind of background, things like that, so they can get to know you a little bit. Um, I grew up in upstate New York and, uh, right smack dab between Oneida and Cayuga and, uh, our property growing up, our house was probably 75 yards from a feeder to the Susquehanna mm. and, um, I fished all over that Huffy could take me as a young man. <laughs> and uh should have been sponsored by Huffy back in those days. Uh probably at, uh probably about within 45 to you know 45 minutes to an hour and a half of the house I could catch everything from you know big brook trout and brown trout to you know walleye musky you know it, just about everything that existed and it, it was uh it was a great learning tool um so growing up, I, I, I fished for everything that had fins. If it was big of whatever species, I I, I liked doing it. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I mean, I even ice fished up there just to uh, so I wouldn't go nuts in the winter and everything. And um, you know, anything fishing related, I was addicted to it at, at a really young age. And uh, which is kind of ironic. Nobody in my immediate family my mother father or anybody fished um and uh everything that i learned uh from an early age was uh strictly from uh reading and going out and being able to do i was very fortunate uh to grow up where i grew up um i fished uh you know all over upstate new york canada quetico all that really young age um, I think I even went, uh, lane lock salmon fishing for a couple of years in Maine when I was like 17, 18 years old. I, I mean, I, I was addicted to it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, and then, uh, the Marine Corps took me all over the world and I fished everywhere I went and, uh, river smallmouth in my blood going back to when I was a kid. That's my, that's my jam. That, that's all I fish for. Uh, that's all I've fished for, for, uh, probably about 25, 30 years now has been strictly river smallmouth. Nice. That's cool. Well, that's, yeah. yeah. You got a fellow, uh, Marine here sitting here with you. Matt's Matt was, uh, in the Marines as well. Yes, yeah, sir. I am aware. I, I, I saw your guys' uh, post there on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that was at, that was at my wedding, dude. Me and me and Brad, uh, he'll send me that like randomly or send it. That's like one of my favorite pictures for me and Brad. And we've got yeah. a bunch of stupid ones. But yeah, I, I'll tell you, like I've uh, we've been talking and stuff. I didn't know you were in the Marine Corps. So that's dope. So Semper Raw to you as well. Um, 
What you do in the Marine Corps? Service. Oh, for sure. Mil- military police. Oh yeah. So you were, you were in charge of wrangling. I was a grunt, so I'm sure you loved us because <laughs> we did stupid stuff all the time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. I love hearing these stories. It's it's fun. Oh yeah, there is there is many a time. So down in, I'll give you a little story. Down in Camp Lejeune, there's a. Uh, so how all the barracks are, especially for like the grunts. Uh, it was in Third Battalion, Six Marines, India Company, which was right down by, uh, right off PT Road, and we had Second Tanks when the Marine Corps had tanks, uh, right next to us, and we, were, we just got back from like, I think we just got back from Cax, so it's where you go, you go out to the desert in Cali and do a bunch of stupid stuff for a month and a half to get ready for deployment. And everyone was going insane. We were leaving deployment for like two weeks. Everyone's like just doing something stupid. We got back on a Thursday and our first art came out. It was like, oh yeah, we're going to go ahead and give you guys a 96. And I was like, what? That's awesome. I'm not going anywhere. So everyone's like going insane. And it got to the point, the tanks were so butthurt because it was like four in the morning on a Friday morning. They have to go to work the next day, do stuff. And we're just being louder and loud. We got music blaring from every single barracks room. So it's like 40 set. Like I'm listening to metal. I got that blaring out of my room. We got some like rap going out of the third floor and pop going out of the first. Like it just sounds terrible. But to us, it's great. <laughs> uh, so out of nowhere, we see PMO start rushing, like not rushing the field, but like there's three cars that are driving through the grass. And you could, I mean, it could have been like someone dropped a grenade. Cause it was just like run like ants or, uh, or stuff <laughs> running away from the light, like cockroaches. And we're all sitting there like, Oh, what to do? Oh, no. like just do it. Like just doing dumb stuff. Like trying to like the guys down the smoke pit, trying to hide all the empty bottles of liquor and stuff that we like, they're not supposed to have. And PMO's coming and they're on the thing. Everybody stop moving. And then everyone's just running. <laughs> and like, at one point, like I was going down, I was finally doing laundry. I'm walking down. I see it. And I was like, Oh no, I'm not doing anything, but I'm going to run anyway. So I start booking in PTs. I got like my Ranger silkies on and flip flops. And I just book it behind the armory across the road into the woods, which is like a swamp. And there's like 20 of us there. And this is how this is different. Like people in the civilian world, like you run, you're like, just all running. You're like, Oh, I don't know where the cops are. When we, we run, no matter what MOS you are, you get into the woods and you see like lights and stuff, you like get a battle plan and you start doing like patrol formations and stuff. Just it was, it was just ridiculous. But we ended up all over the base. I ended up down in uh, I don't know, like two miles away in the French section of the the base, as far as I could get away. And then we're walking around. I didn't know the MP barracks was down there because I was a boot still. And I'm walking in front. Of, there's these there's guys coming out. I'm like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, just walking. And they, they're coming, getting ready to go on duty. So they got their belt on and they always, MPs always look the best in uniform, like in uniform every day. Cause just like law enforcement does here. And they, they're like, come over here real quick. I was like, nope. And I just started sprinting back to my barracks. I made it back at like 7 a.m. Our first sergeant's out there the next day. Sergeant major had to come from the battalion. It was like, it was bad. Uh, needless to say, we didn't actually get a 96 and we went to the field for three more days over the weekend. So that happened but yeah there's a little uh uh, fun story for everybody (laughs) that's funny (laughs) oh man but so we we had you on there me and brad's talked all the time i mean people ask us hey you guys fish in the winter oh yeah oh you guys are crazy yeah we like to fish but we've last year and uh, so far this fall we've kind of struggled i wouldn't say struggled like big time we've caught big fish but we haven't caught the numbers we kind of thought so we wanted to yeah. bring you on to kind of talk about that fall to winter transition and what your mind really does how you're looking at it differently what gear you're starting to pick up start, starting to put down and things like that so brad where do you want to kind of that's heck, uh let's start like let's just start off right here where we're at now because we all know that the fish are moving to to like faster moving water near their winter holes right not mine <laughs> no okay so yeah we no. we we don't really know what's no. going on here so. a- 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 no absolutely not okay uh, so yeah. what's happening at this time of the year um 
Have you guys been fishing anywhere where you see catfish or carp or rough fish or anything of that nature? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will say we've been seeing a lot more carp and catching. We have been catching fish around the carp. I mean, I caught two or three the last time I went out. That's absolutely right. And they're nowhere near current. Okay. So it, are, are you just looking for like deeper water with ro- like a rocky bottom then? Um, depth, depth is uh, most certainly one part of it. Um, now, y- you know, on one river, what is deep may differ from another river, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now, the one thing at River Smallmouth that winter – uh, will not do is be in an area that's going to be or could be uh, swept out uh, mm-hmm. it, with, you know, snow melt, uh, really high, you know, rain, say, you know, you get some freak storm in February or something that, uh, you know, raises the water up, uh, you know, 16 to 20 inches and stuff like that. They want security. Mm-hmm. And, and uh you know, with that comes, you want bottom substrate that's not going to be moving even in a high water event. Um, if you're seeing carp, catfish, rough fish, a- anything of that nature, you know, everyone thinks, well, you know, there's a, you know, the lowly carp uh, meandering over there. Well, smallmouth are going to be near them this time of year. Uh, they're they're not dumb. They don't they don't want any part of you know high water events either. Um, now the waters that I fish, the best wintering holes that it may be, heck, five miles, ten miles between mm-hmm. good wintering holes that I'm going to fish and really hunker down on in the winter, and I don't mess with anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I go straight to those spots uh, midday at the you know peak of the warmth, uh, which is very little right now, of mm-hmm. course. And you know, right about that eleven hundred, you know, marine, marine law enforcement term, eleven o'clock, eleven a.m. You know, time frame till you know about at the latest about you know fifteen hundred to three p.m. Uh, I'm, I'm getting off the water. Um, you want to maximize those fishes, you know, energy levels midday. Now, if you can get a three day warming trend, four day warming trend where, you know, that temperature spikes up, you know, you want to watch your gauges where your water temp, if that water temp goes up four or five, six degrees, that's substantial. Mm -hmm. It really is. That's a lot. Um, now, what you'll find is a lot of these wintering holes where they stack, um, ideally what you want on the weak side of the river is you want some kind of refuge for those fish on those warm days to pull out of that deeper water on the strong side of the river where, you know, deeper, maybe a little bit more current, not riffles or, you know, summer stuff, but... Mm-hmm where they can move laterally to the weak side of a river midday. And I mean, you'll see them sunbathing on the weak side of a river. And then as the day progresses, they will literally move back into their, you know, into their sanctuary, which is that deeper water. And it's really pretty phenomenal to see. Um, I, I've had them, you know, schooled up literally right under my kayaks, and uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, uh, I've typically got about anywhere from 12 to 15 foot of visibility this time of year, mm-hmm. and I, it's really helped me, uh, you know, living on the water and being able to w- watch what they do over all these years. Um, and I wrote a lot about that. Uh, w- with uh, uh, my friend Ned Cady on the end fisherman for years. Uh 
Uh oh, did we lose him? I think you know, lost and I, him. I'm sure uh, know you know some people have read that stuff, and uh, uh, that that winter deal is not. You can take really good sticks, and like you know, in that cold water period, I've seen some really good sticks that struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's a different deal. It's a different mindset. Um, you, you know, you got to lay off the coffee in the morning and, and pretty much forget your reel's got a handle on it. And <laughs> you've got to be, you know, in the kayak game, you've got to be stationary. Yep. Um, I absolutely cannot emphasize that enough where you want to be stationary. If you're moving, I guarantee you that you're not catching as many, um, nearly as many bigger fish as if you're anchored up and totally stationary okay Um, the other thing you know i I watch videos here and there of you know people cold water fishing and if i see you know somebody's rod going from like the nine o'clock to the 12 o'clock position i'm like well they they got some learning to do Mm -hmm. um your rod shouldn't move um, all the lures that I work in the cold water period, uh, I work right off the reel and, mm. but you know, my, my elbow was like locked in, on my inner knee in the kayak and it's stationary. So you're uh, just dragging whatever you're throwing on the bottom. Well, I've got, I've got two modes, um, for wintering fish. And, you know, if you kept, if you, get it right with that three-day warming trend um you know they'll rise to a bait and by rise i mean you know they might come up two or three feet for a bait um you know probably everybody and their brother will thrown a suspending jerk bait in the winter yep yep uh, well that you know that's one way to do it but that's only one way to do it you know there's other other things you can be doing um river smallmouth in my experience in the cold water period are going to do one of two things if you hit the weather right with that warming trend they'll rise if not you better know how to dead stick Mm -hmm. and i mean like really dead stick a bait uh they're either going to rise or they're going to go tail down on a bait and it's one or the other um i can be you know three or four or five feet off with a cast uh, from where uh, I think they're set up and I won't catch anything. Mm-hmm. Um, they are that finicky. I mean, they really are. Um, you know, in the horizontal stuff of, you know, fall, you know, when they're uh, supposedly chewing, you know, the prop off your motor on the kayak and, you know, all these things you hear and everything. Um, yeah. You know, that stuff goes away. Uh, you get in the mid 40 degree water temp stuff, uh, you, you better know how to finesse them. Yeah. And even big fish. Uh, I, I think a lot of people would be surprised. Uh, you know, your bigger fish could be had on some very small lures, you know, in the cold water period. Yep. Um, and years ago, uh, I, I think that's when I really started experimenting with, uh, uh, you know, back in the day, before the Ned Rig craze hit, um, I, w- I was doing that. And I think that's probably why Ned, Katie, and I hit it off so so well over the years is um, like at about the height of, you know, when that was a big deal and everything, I had already been doing it for you know, seven, eight, nine years. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, I started experimenting with, you know, heck baits that are like two inches long, two, two and a quarter inches long, you know, um, y- your standard neg- Ned rig stuff is like two and a half, you know, two and three quarter and all this, but I was reducing them down even further. And I think, uh, you know, we're starting to see that a little bit with the micro stuff and all yeah. that. And, I had no doubt that at some point that would come along, but, you know, and um, that small stuff will take big fish in the cold water period. It really will. 
Yeah, I need, I need to start picking up some of that micro stuff for sure. But yeah, all I use right now is like the little regular TRD. But uh, I, you you hit something important that I don't think a lot of people realize is anchoring your kayak. And me and Matt, we're at, everything you mentioned. Me and Matt are really close to sticking to what you told us to do. So we're always anchored on a spot. We fan cast. I have that issue where I like raise my rods slowly. Like you said, don't do that. So I'm going to change that. But everything you said, uh, we're, we're almost there. It seems like the we're missing one piece of the puzzle though. Yeah. It seems like, uh, like last year I it's, it's hard, right? So especially if you're, I, I count myself, Brad's the same way as power fisherman. I don't like just to sit, even when I'm throwing a Ned rig in the summer and when it's hard, I'm still, tip tapping it or walking it or dragging it like i just can't ever just sit there i fish them fast which brad fishes the net even faster than me i've made myself slow down but last year i caught a couple well yeah, i'm talking about the summer <laughs> yeah. but in the winter last year i was kind of doing the same thing just a little bit more subtly like tic tac and i wasn't getting anything and i was like you know what i'm gonna i reeled up because i throw mine on casting i reeled it up and i said i'm just gonna throw it out there I know this is a hole because i've caught fish out of here we caught fish out of here the last time we were here that there's fish in here and I just threw out the net and I was like, I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to count to 30 in my head. It's the same way when jerk bait fishing becomes difficult. I'll throw a, a vision 110 out there when the water gets a little chilly, it likes to sink a little bit more. I'll throw it out there and I will count to 20. And then I won't do a pop or anything until I hit once I hit 20 pop. Uh, but I did the same thing. And then I started catching fish on the net, like just dead sticking it. I'd count to 30 and yeah. probably at 20 to 28 seconds. I'd get the hit. And sometimes when he was really a hit, it was a more, I felt like they were like nudging it and then I'd feel it and just pop it a little bit. And then 10 seconds on it. So they were, I mean, what I'm getting from that is they're staring. It's either right next to them and right. they're cold enough to the, where they're, they're wanting, do I want to eat it? Do I not want to eat it? Or they're just staring daggers at it, seeing yeah. what it's going to do and see if it's worth my time to, use the calories and energy that I'm not getting a ton of to, to eat. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, right behind our house, uh, you know, I've got the luxury of, I can see them go tail down on a bait in, uh, it, you know, 10, 12 foot of water uh, this time of year. And, um, you know, you compound that by, you know, uh, we've lived here 17, 18 years now. And, and uh, you know, they're pretty much my pet fish. And <laughs> I, I have uh, experimented with everything under the sun on those fish. And they, they've seen everything. And I, I can tell you right now that they cannot stand a bait that is dead stick for any length of time. It, 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 they just don't, they want to move it. They want to get it out of there. They don't, they, they don't want it there. Um, it, it's really something to watch um, because most people would think that, you know, after a certain amount of time, well, they're, they're either, uh, you know, rubbing in through their tackle bag or, they're about ready to, you know, hit the house to go sit next to the fireplace like any sane person would. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, they wouldn't think they were fishing near as many fish as they are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think probably three of the biggest uh, things that hurt cold water anglers is uh, if you, you know, even have a, shadow of a doubt that you're fishing you know slow enough is slow down um you know it, and there, there's no rod tip movement it, you know none of that and your best wintering holes are quite honestly guys found in the summer um mm -hmm. i do an awful lot of scouting in the summer months yep. and sometimes it pays off um you know and other times uh i will have you know, went five or six miles on the river and uh, been like, man, this has got all the ingredients, but something's missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be any number of factors that, you know, um, 
it, it could be a wintering hole that's in a canyon that gets absolutely no sun whatsoever, which I deal with a lot. I've got a lot of water like that. Um, and, and they're just that inactive. Um, and quite honestly, guys, I mean, uh, is there bait? Is there food mm-hmm. you know, around them? Uh, now, all of those factors uh, combined with what could be a tremendous wintering hole if there's not food there, obviously they're not going to be there. Right. Um, oh yeah. It's, it's kind of like the show we had with Torin. He, uh, we were talking about like what, what he's like, this was summer fishing and stuff like that. But it was, I, he said, what was it? The four or the five aspects that smallmouth are looking for. They're looking for oxygenated water. They're looking for, uh, a rocky or like a, a nice harder bottom. They don't really like to live in soft bottom. They were looking for what else were they looking for? Uh, flow, but it's not necessarily flow. Like it doesn't have to be like white water, like moving like a uh, flow. W- w- shut up, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since Jeff Little taught him about laminar flow, that's all, I get random texts throughout the word laminar flow. Okay, <laughs> I still don't understand it. Every okay, this had yeah. nothing to do with we're talking about, but rabbit hole time, Matt, because you love going down them, and everyone loves to listen to them. And if you don't, you're listening to the wrong podcast. Uh, <laughs> We, every time me and Brad go out, I'll ask him because we'll be fishing. I was like, is this laminar flow? And he'll look at me dead face and says, I don't know. I Dude. think so. Because I still don't get it. So, Jeff, if you're, if you're listening, A, congratulations on your new job with Boondocks. That's awesome. B, text me what laminar flow is in Barney terms because I'm stupid. And well, I don't me, uh, know. Maybe I, I might be able to help. Um, I'm about it. Uh, we've all seen like a Lay's potato chip from the side. It's got the, it's got this, right? Yeah. It's got like the V's. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does your bottom have that? Uh, in what you guys are questioning, whether or not it's laminar flow or not, uh, does the bottom have those ridges on it or those spines? I would say maybe in a cut like yeah. I haven't really thought about that. I would say it's more. If it doesn't, that's laminar flow. I would say the one stretch that we just went on that I asked you if that's laminar flow, and you said I don't know. It was more rocky <laughs> and more ridged and everything. I remember yeah. that because I was like, "This is awesome!" Because I was throwing a jig or not a jig. I was throwing a Ned rig, and I was like, "I feel everything" because it was all rocky, and I was like, "There's got to be fish here," which there were three hours later but still uh but there's one section that two three times before that i said hey is this laminar flow and again brad says i don't know that is smooth so that would be laminar right. flow the smooth is laminar flow okay well now i know where it's at because there's yeah. like three or four sections that are laminar yes. flow except one of the, yeah. one of those sections sucks yeah. to fish i hate it and it doesn't ever produce anything good <laughs> but you said on the strong side of a river they like to set up when the water is lower. Right. But so if, if the water does go up, they go on the weak side of the river in, in the winter time. Is that what I'm uh, if, you've got increase, if, if you've got increasing water temps uh, throughout the day from like that 10 a.m. to about 3 p.m. deal, uh, they will move from the strong side to the weak side. And they were literally like sunbathe. On that on that weaker side of the river, because they're trying to get to warmer water. I'm assuming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. that's interesting. And they will drop back. They will go back right across the river as the day progresses, and they will stay there until another warmer day. They don't go. They're not going north and north and south at all. Mm-hmm. They're not moving like that. They've already found their comfort zone. But they will move left and right in a river. That's interesting. That's super um, interesting. And, so, and, you know, one thing I can really stress, guys, and, and I think I probably missed it, was uh, your, your bottom substrate, you want to be fishing in areas where it is not going anywhere. In, in the, the event of a high water event, like if – you know, you've got boulders that haven't moved in years. Yep. That's a good area. 
Um, some rivers are more timber, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, however, I wouldn't be looking at anything for a wintering area where that timber could possibly move. Now, right. if you've got some kind of big old root ball, you know, that, that's wedged into the side of the river and it's not going anywhere. So you got to, you know, it's wrapped up in two trees. Uh, and it extends out into the water, good area. But that's the only time that I mess with wood in the winter is okay. if you've got wood that is absolutely not moving in a high water event. So you're uh, really looking for that real hard bottom that no matter what type of blowout you're going to have, the bottom's not going to change. Like, right. Or if it does, it's so so minimal, you don't really notice it. It's like that hard bottom. Right. Interesting. And, there's um, two or three winter I holes also, that me and Brad go to that aren't like you know, that. really try to key on the wintering areas that I try to key on with all of that in mind are also like straight ledge holes. Um if you're looking straight up and down river and you can see, you know, way up or way behind you in a straight line, mm -hmm. um that's where you want to be. Um, you do not want to be in areas of the river that are snaking. Okay. Because you've got, you've got upsurges in your CFS. Yep. Mm -hmm. On those outer bends, they will not winter there. They, they don't want any part of that. Okay. So just basically like straight, straight runs, straight deep runs with big rock that won't move. Absolutely. Gotcha. And uh, preferably on the weak side, uh, if you've got, you know, with all of that being said, on that weak side, if you've got a like a light colored sand, they they will literally suspend right over there in numbers like you wouldn't believe, like midday. Huh. huh. You'll have you can eat very easily. You could very easily have like 12 or 15 fish that will move to the weak side of that river and just literally sunbathe over that light colored bottom midday. And it, it's awesome to see. I mean, it, it's really cool. Um, it, you, you won't be able to see that kind of stuff in our river. <laughs> well, we you don't... can't, you can't see into our river. Yeah. It, we, we got a pretty dirty river. It's, it's the, the color of, baby vomit it's terrible even the your, clearest it's uh, ever been is like a foot <laughs> right your fish have more security than mine do mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah i can definitely see that yeah absolutely they will not be nearly as spooky you know as the fish that i go after um now you know some of the waters that i fish are exactly like you know what you're saying um uh now my favorite ones are you know they're about two casts wide uh you got to be about half billy goat to fish them and probably a little <laughs> bit nuts you know and uh people aren't people aren't gonna you know mess with them and it, that's a prescription for uh you know growing giants it is uh yeah out of the way and uh going where nobody else is you know is even going to attempt to mess with um and i can't stress that enough i think a lot of people would be surprised if they got off the beaten path and um you know the size of smallmouth some some of my biggest ones have come out of you know cast wide waters even That's after all these years yeah, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that goes back to we we love you know ha having Drew on the show, Drew Gregory. For everyone who doesn't know, when yeah. I say Drew, Drew on the show, chasing the wild. I mean, yeah. it's it's oh, yeah. it's 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 awesome to think because there's a lot of stuff. I mean, the river reef we fish like we fish a lot of urban river, like going snaking through Dayton and you know seeing how many sure. you know, that one game we find is how many heroin needles you can find is great. Um, <laughs> but there's also a lot of stretch that we haven't really, I don't think we've put, I mean, Brad, maybe you have, but I know even you 
sometimes we'll fall into just fishing the same stretches over and over and over. Yeah. Or we kind of rotate through like six. I yeah. think last summer we rotated through like six or seven stretches. We would just billy goat off every single one of them. Like we're jumping up every uh, rock you can find up the mountain, but we just keep going in circles because we keep hitting the same ones. And there's a lot of stretches we haven't really given a lot of time. I know, Brad, you got off the beaten path this year with your little water walk. And uh, I mean, you found some decent sized fish back in that little water walk. And that wasn't that big. Water walk? The wolf. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you can bleep it if you want, but you made me say it. So that's what you get. Oh, I forgot uh, about that. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> you know how many people have uh have messaged me saying you should go try to fish that? It's just I people around it. Dayton who was like, Yeah, I just go wade that all the time. Yeah. I, and I was it. like I was like, Yeah, I, I heard it's not good. But so, apparently it is. I've never fished it, so I don't know. Yeah. There's but. there's one stretch that comes to mind after talking about all this. So it's a it's a stretch that me, Matt, and Justin all refer to as just apartments. And we're the only ones that oh, know yeah. what that means. So yep. this I believe that this is a, a winter hole. It, it's a long straight run, like you said. There's big rock down there on the bottom that will not move. The, there's riffles Ever. upstream couple hundred yards downstream it's just like calm slow moving water so mm -hmm. one side of the river has some some barriers that stops current the other side has not slow moving water at all so what you're saying is they'll move from like the deeper water to the uh non-moving water when it gets warm out am i understanding that right yeah, they'll essentially get on the weak side of the river um, to pick off bait fish. So I'm I'm fishing this whole area wrong then. So what I need to do is start, you know, start at one section of the river, fan cast, and then like slide horizontal across the river until I can find them, right? Is that a good how strategy? Long a, how long of a stretch is it? From like riffle to riffle? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Probably about half mile. Okay, I, I'll yeah. guarantee you there's wintering fish there. Okay. Now, now here's the deal. Um, I would probably fish that for about three to four times straight, mm -hmm. with no time constraints, and really learn it. Okay, and just like hit like a different part of it each yeah. time I go. Yes. Okay. Cause yep. I, I know where, where the riffle starts, there's like a big point that comes. It's like a point, an actual point that goes down into the river. So if the water does rise, like there's a whole like slack, big calm pocket right behind it. So right. I always try to fish that in the winter and I never have any luck, which I'm not, I just don't know if I'm fishing that area correctly or not. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what, what Slow down. pocket you're talking about. Slow down. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've got videos yeah. of me actually fishing with the Ned rig and stuff, and people always comment on it. Dude, that doesn't look fun. And I'm just sitting here like this with my head down, right. just waiting. <laughs> right. It's yeah, tough. It, you know, I'll be the, it can I'll be, be the torture first. sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, if I'm dead sticking a bait for uh, two and three, four minutes where I'm convinced there's a 20 or better, um, you know, it's not exactly like, you know, I'm out throwing a six inch bullshit or something. I, I, but you, you do what you got to do. And I'm mm -hmm. a firm believer that you know, uh, one of my mentors told me years ago that you throw what they'll always eat. And I'm telling you right now, you put a Ned rig in front of a Smalley. I mean, about the only thing you can do wrong with it is fish it too fast. Yeah. And not make it look natural. Yep. Uh, I mean, if somebody wants to uh, screw up a Ned rig, fish it too fast. And use too much lead and be doing some kind of you know wild dippity do's with the rod up and down and all this stuff. Nothing in nature looks like that. 
Right. It, it, yeah. I mean, it just doesn't. Um, if if somebody, you know, goes to a boat ramp and they throw a Ned rig out in clear water or a pool or, you know, what have you, and they looked and saw it like on your typical, you know, seven foot, seven and a half foot spinning rod, just simply going from like nine to 11 o'clock, what that's doing to a Ned rig. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it looks like a crawdad on crack. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I you can know, see that. It, it, it just, I, we all grow up wanting to impart action into our lures. Yep. You know, yeah. and what we've all waited in drag kayaks and, you know, and all this stuff for years. And, you know, you, you don't see anything moving like that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, nat- natural it, as possible makes sense. It, it, it just, uh, I, and I can't stress that enough in the cold water period. Mm-hmm. And um, success in the cold water period is an art form. I mean, it really is. Um, when you're simply watching for the deflection of that tip on your rod, to, almost like a wet leaf, I mean, you, you know, when you've got the deflection in your tip going just simply like that, and that's what you waited the last 20 minutes for, that's that's an art, you know, mm-hmm. to be able to de- detect that and have the uh, stick to it to be able to, you know, capitalize on that. Yeah. Um, and a lot, of, you know, just like I said earlier, a lot of good sticks, they struggle in a cold water period. You know, they really do. And, mm-hmm. and um, I've just been fortunate, you know, over the years to uh, live near water, you know, pretty much all my life. And uh, I was a core group of, you know, what the, I guess what the kids call old heads that started doing this thing so many years ago, you know. And uh, I remember there was a group of us like uh, Jeff Little and myself and, you know, about a half dozen to 10 of us that were on the old river smallies.com site. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we were a core group of just hardcore guys and it didn't matter what the weather was doing. We were going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And, and it just took a lot of experimentation mm-hmm. with what works, you know, and a lot of time on the water. I mean, yeah. a, a lot of years, you know, doing it. Um, yeah. The cold water thing isn't for everyone. I mean, it just isn't. And that's okay. But, you know, if uh, if I've got a better chance of, uh, you know, seeing a, you know, a six-legged turkey than I do seeing <laughs> anybody else on the water, you know, I, I want to be on the water. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I, I don't see anybody in the winter. Yeah, it's and, nice. You know, and it's yeah, it really you know, is. You know, um, and I love it. Um, I, I really do. Even after all these years, I, I, you know, the potential to go out and, uh, you know, get three or four or five, you know, fish that are like 18, 19, and up over 20 out of, you know, one spot is pretty, it's pretty awesome. I mean, it really is. It, very rewarding for sure when you yeah. catch a fish in the winter. Yes. <laughs> it kind of goes. Yeah. It, it was one of the shows. I can't remember which show it was on, but we were talking about just the excitement you get from fishing and stuff. And I was like, yeah, when you're in the winter, you're cold, your hands are shivering, you're freezing, you're sitting there dead stick in a Ned rig, contemplating how stupid you are being on the water, even in a dry suit with a sweatshirt and sweatpants underneath a cold blast of wind goes and you feel it go right to your heart. <laughs> and then you get, then you get a bite and that's, you explained it perfect. You put your finger up people who aren't watching on YouTube and they're listening, put your index finger up and just barely move that first joint. And that's pretty much what you're waiting for. Cause it's not Yeah. sometimes if you really get them on, if they're on fire, you're throwing a jerk bait or something, they'll feel like they're going to rip the rod out of your hand in the middle of December. But that's most fun. of the time, Oh, that's the best bite. A jerk bait's my favorite fishing. It's the best bite ever. But most of the time in the winter, you'll just feel, you'll just see the raw tip. And sometimes you don't even feel it. You see it. You just see that right. tip just 
dip a little bit and it's not yeah. even fast. It's usually a creep because they're just taking the weight and they're putting it in their mouth and they're sitting there. They're not running with it. They're not moving yeah. it. Um, second, yeah. you get that. I don't care what the air temp is. I don't care what the water temp is. You go from zero degrees inside to about 287 degrees Fahrenheit and you're on fire for like half an hour. Even yeah. if it's like a 15 inch fish, it's like, let's go. Yeah. I feel great. I could fish all yeah. day. And then 45 minutes, an hour goes by and you're like, man, that fish was awesome. But I don't know if I have toes anymore. And that's where you're right, right back into it until you catch another fish. So, yeah, right. I mean, winter fishing, it's it's the most rewarding type of fishing, in my opinion, just because of how much work you have to do. You explained it. It's an art. I mean, it really is. And it's something that right. I'm not even like super good at yet. And I can definitely say it's an art because you have to a have the patience that most fishermen don't have, which, again, is OK. That just means but, there's more water for me to be on. Right. And the but, tenacity to sit there and dead stick a Ned rig for 45 minutes. Yeah. And it makes you a better fisherman throughout the rest of the year, too. Yes, it does. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely does. Uh, I, I I couldn't agree with that more. Um, I, I I don't know how many volumes of work um, I, I've got on the end fisherman stating that very fact right there. Mm -hmm. um, Ned and I talked about that a lot. Ned Katie is a phenomenal winter fisherman. I mean, he really is. Uh, you know, that's where all of this started, uh, was him, you know, going out in January and February, for God's sake, in, in Kansas, you know, in the these Dead Sea reservoirs and putting up numbers that people hadn't seen before with these little rigs. Um, and I couldn't agree more that if you're good at that, in the winter, um, I guarantee you somebody's probably a pretty darn good stick in the fair weather months. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Oh, yeah. So, is there any other type of lure that somebody should be looking out for to use in the winter time, other than like a Ned rig and a jerk bait? Well, you know the one thing too, um, the Ned rig. Uh, I think kind of got green bassified given its popularity. Mm -hmm. I mean, or the original prescription for that was two and a half inches long and we fished them on the original 32nd and 16th ounce gophers with, you know, size six and four hooks. Mm -hmm. That was the original prescription for like, I don't know how many times, you know, if I had a dime for every time I, you know, type that um back when it i about got laughed off of river smallies.com when i when i adopted ned rig fishing it i mean people were thinking i was nuts you know that's how it was and um you know well i i you know i fish a grub and i fish a small tube and all this i don't need that thing but there is something about a ned rig um but i will say this in the cold water period i think probably most people are using too much lead, mm -hmm. uh, too big of hooks, and I think they need to probably scale their Ned rig down uh, from what they're using. Uh, it, you know, somebody could say that they're using, you know, uh, a two and three quarter and this and that, and I want to catch bigger fish and all that. I don't care. Uh, you know, I've taken 21 inch smallies in the middle of winter on a on a two inch Ned. Mm hmm. Oh yeah. You know, and, um, if somebody were to go back into the, you know, way back years when, uh, you know, Jeff came out with his little tube, yep. uh, you know, that thing was just a glorified crappie tube, quite honestly, that he could put, you know, the sled head in and, um, you know, for winter fishing where they weren't coming down and, you know, pecking the legs off, a, off a tube. Um, those small tubes were are absolutely deadly. I mean, they are. I, you know, I, I've got a variation of that that I use in the winter. Um, uh, it's essentially a uh, Yamamoto double tail hula grub that I, you know, I take the legs off of and I shorten the. Uh, it's two and a half inches long, and um, 
you know, I rig it pretty much like uh, somebody would a fat Ica, mm-hmm. you know, back in the day to back glide. Mm-hmm. Um, and I fish it without lead, no jig head. And, um, you know, just a little nail weight right there where it's going to make contact with the bottom. And I'll dead, I'll dead stick that thing. And, it, you know, heck, two and a half inches might be exaggerated. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it's it, it's small. It, it's a small bait. Um, on days that they're wanting to dead stick, I'm either, you know, I've got the Yamamoto Ned, about two and a half inches. I caught, I caught a half inch off a three inch floater. And, um, and then I've got that modified, you know, that it starts out as a four inch, you know, four inch double tail hula grub and Mm -hmm. it, you know, gets reduced in size and it's a killer in the winter. Um, or I'm drop shotting. It's one or the other. I'm either dead sticking or I'm right above them. And, uh, with a shad shape worm, three incher, you know, little, okay. and uh, yeah. and just dead sticking that thing. Yeah, that's Those one thing I haven't done in the winter yet. Here is drop shotting, which I, we don't. I don't drop shot the river. I, I probably should drop it more. Yeah, same. Uh, but that's one thing this winter I was going to do is pretty, pretty much go out there with the Ned rod, a jerk bait, and a drop shot. That's all I was going to yep. throw. Yeah. Uh, and the Ned was either going to be a normal TRD, which I'll probably shrink it up, or the two inch depths cover scat. Throw that on there. That's one of the small ones. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I might even make that smaller. I'll get some of the finesse, or not finesse, but the micro TRDs. Yeah. So what what size weight do you recommend for like a Ned rig hook? As small it, it, as little as possible. Okay. Uh, now. What is the um, smallest? Like a tenth? I think a tenth. Well, uh, they have they, the micro I mean, stuff now. A, yeah, they make a sixteenth. Uh, they okay. make a one twentieth. Uh, finesse rooms. Um, you know, they make the Ned locks in a one one fifteenth. Um, you know, th- there's all kinds of weighting systems for the Ned out there. Um, but the one thing that I would say is it, it's you kind of want to you want to give them the longest look you can on the drop, mm-hmm. but you also don't want your lure skating across the bottom. You want to be able to dead stick it, mm-hmm. but that drop rate is essential. Um, it, it would be really easy for me to say, you know, you know, rig up a quarter ounce ball head, and it, you know, it's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. But I guarantee you, I won't catch anything either that that right there is probably my my issue i'm i'm using like a fifth ounce. so it's not it, it's it's drop rate in addition to that undulation We lost you. Uh, to answer the question, the smallest you can get is a one thirtieth. Wow. Yep. There he goes. <laughs> yep. It's uh, all good. I'm but sure a one thirtieth. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he's going to jump back in. Um, one thirtieth. See, I think that's my problem too, especially if he's bringing up drop rate. So I throw a quarter ounce. I throw the jig masters. Yeah. Quarter ounce. And, I don't know when I mean, I tell you last year when I was throwing the tenth ounce from Z Man. I really, I mean, I feel like I was catching more fish, but I felt like my bait wasn't staying rooted to the ground as much. Like I throw the tenth ounce, right. and I feel like I I got way more on the drop. I'll say that probably because it was going slower to the drop, but any type of moving water, it just skittered on down. So I yeah. was like, I'm done with this. I'm just going to throw a quarter ounce and call it a day. Because there's no moving water in our area that's going to make that move. Uh, yeah, I always thought about using a lighter weight too for for the fall bite, but like, I don't know, dude. There he is. He's back. Hey, sorry guys, I'm in the middle of nowhere here. <laughs> oh, you're good. No, you're 
you're believe me i'm not in the middle of nowhere and my internet also sucks so <laughs> um just from which i know the last thing we heard was about fall rate and uh, just for everyone's knowledge i already said it but say it again they make a one thirtieth size in the micro and yeah. the micro which is i don't have anything that could throw that yeah i don't think like i might be able to force my casting rod to do it but it ain't gonna like it yeah here's the deal with uh you know you want to give them the longest look on that drop to get them intrigued mm -hmm. and you don't want that lure moving but here's the deal with that the heavier you, you go to keep that bait stationary they're going to drop it the retention rate on a heavier heavier ned especially in the cold water months they're going to drop it i guarantee you know and you that's why when they pick up that light one as light as possible they're going to the retention rate is just skyrockets you know they don't drop that hmm. that's interesting well i'm going to have to uh update my arsenal <laughs> Because well, I'm say, using I'm, nothing but fifth ounce right now. I might get some uh some fifteenth or not fifteenth, some ten tenths. Yeah. One tenth just yeah, for that's a, uh that's a small one. In the Ned locks. Because so I like throwing my TRDs in like Brad, I don't know why he doesn't do it, but I like throwing mine Texas rigged for the simple fact or skin skin rigged, so I can just throw it in the nastiest crap I can find because I usually pull fish out of that. And I was losing too many jigs and as kayak anglers we all know i i don't know about you guys i still hate tying on my boat mm -hmm. like it's just annoying my especially because i throw like eight pounds so i've well, I have seven pound shooter on my finesse rod and that stuff i could breathe normally and my line will be like goodbye and it just goes away and it stays in the air and it's a pain in the butt and then i want to fight my own boat so uh <laughs> yeah I, I i just hate retying so i do the the ned the ned locks which i've heard a couple people say it's a different it like puts the trd at a weird angle and they don't bite it as well i haven't ran into that but i'm sure it probably is true i don't know but yeah i just need to get some lighter ones yeah um is there anything we missed i'll send you an article i'll send you an article uh that ned and i did on um the original 32nd and 16th ounce gopher heads. And number one, they're going to hang less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have smaller hooks in them. And when, when I started talking about the Neds, um, and I said that, you know, it's largely a technique that in a lot of circles has been green bassified. It's because of the bigger hooks. The, the, the hooks that are being used now, weren't even close to what we, you know, used originally on that rig. And, and um, the amount of lead being used, you know, the weight and all this, well, you know, people will say, well, I'm fishing in current and, you know, I can't get my bait down and this and that and the other. But, well, that's when a salt content of what you're putting on, on there comes into play. Mm-hmm. Now, if I leach all of the salt out of a, you know, whatever, say I take a four inch Senko. Mm -hmm. Okay. A four inch Senko is seven grams in weight. Okay. If, if I soak that and I put it in lukewarm water for about three or four days, I can get where that four inch Senko will float. Mm -hmm. Once I leach all that out of there, you know, mm -hmm. um, now, I cut that down to two and three quarter. That's going to weigh less than two, than a two and three quarter TR date mm -hmm. with all out of the pack. So it's not just lead weight, but it's everything combined. Your lead weight plus your plastic that is affecting that drop rate. Okay. And if you really want to throw, you know, a monkey wrench into the equation, you start getting into baits like. You know, the two and a half inch Yama Tanuki, which is flat. Yep. You know, yeah. That bait 
that two and a half inch Yama Tanuki weighs the same as a four inch Senko. Oh well. Wow. Pretty dense then. Yeah, it's about dense. to say that's how the, the depths cover stat is a super dense bait. Like the little two inch will sink. It's just it's a dense bait. It's it's recommended. Yeah. Depths recommends the uh the four inch or the two two and a quarter inch. They recommend to throw that weightless Texas rig because it will sink itself and it'll float right. straight flat on the way down because all the salt contents in the bottom middle. Right. It's awesome. Love that. I thing. really, uh, I, I, I'm a really big believer in if I can go no lead, I'm all for it. Mm. Um, you know, it, I've got a circle of friends that are. Uh, you know, that I converse with quite a bit. And I'll tell them, like, you know, in the summer months, the best lead is no lead. It, you know, I, I don't want I don't want to have to contend with uh, jig heads and lead and all that stuff. It, and knowing your, you know, drop rates with weightless plastic is, is incredibly advantageous. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. It's but, something I never really thought about because we don't throw a lot of weightless stuff. I mean... Well, other I, than maybe like flukes, a, yeah. Well, fluke. I'm gonna say other than I was gonna say other than a wacky rigger or a fluke. I don't throw anything really weightless. Yeah. Because even if I'm throwing a, a depths cover scat, I have, I'll usually like pin it with a nail weight or something, just to get it down faster. I've which, thrown weightless crawls before. See, I have. Well, I mean, I have. I've thrown a ton of things weightless. I've thrown Texas rig weightless and everything, but I don't really throw those for smallies anymore. So. I don't know. I'm gonna have to start yeah. playing the weightless game a little bit more. No, that's this is all super interesting. It's definitely eye opening a little bit. So I got to change some things and go back to the drawing board per se. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, but that's the thing about fishing is there's always there's always something that you can change or something you can yeah. learn. I don't. You've been in. I mean. Travis, you've been in for 40 years fishing and doing a lot of different things. And I'm sure Ned, Jeff, somebody else could say something to you. Be like, I never thought of it that way. I'm going to start doing that. Like fishing's constantly evolving with what we learn and how to do things. Yeah. There's no one person in this world that I think, and we've interviewed and talked to and are friends with a bunch of really smart fishermen and very good fishermen. No one knows everything. Somebody's always open to learn. So yeah, I mean, that's what. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and, and I think probably my wife would tell you that I'm made up with it, even after all these years. That I mean, I don't, I, I don't golf, I don't go to the movies, we don't go out to eat. I fish. <laughs> Sounds and, just like uh, me. Yep. It, you know, and that's where that's where my money goes. Is that's literally the only thing I spend money on in my life is fishing, and that's all I read about. And yep. I'm just made up with it. Um, and I'll be the first one to tell you what made me better over the years is my willingness to keep trying to get better. Mm -hmm. If, you know, I, a decade ago, I, I really could have said, well, give me about four or five rods on my kayak with different drop rates and different profiles and neds. And I'm good to go. I, I'm going to go out. I'm going to cut, go out and cut smallmouth year round. Mm -hmm. and I would have missed swim baits. I would have missed, you know, bladed jigs. I would have missed yeah. a lot of, you know, just a lot of fun stuff mm -hmm. and productive stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I think some of your best fishermen are never satisfied with being good. Yeah. They want to be better. Yes. Than good, <laughs> you know. Um, oh, man. I, I, I'm still never, every day could be better. I, I'm my own worst critic on the water. Um, and, and I'm tough on yes. myself, you know, in that way, you know. Um, I, I do think that there's something to have, uh, you know, things that are in your wheelhouse that you know. Yep. Um, everything else is kind of, you know, the cherry on the cake, so to speak, but if you've got that core group of baits that you can fish throughout the seasons and, and you know them cold, you're going to be good. You, you, you're going to be doing okay, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
but still having that willingness to learn and go outside the box, it, you know, it, and yeah. uh, it is very, very important. Um, and a lot of, you know, like the, you know, the weight of the Senko versus, you know, the flat, you know, nature of the Yama Tanuki and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff came about with me, you know, honing in drop rates, you know, and getting into the scent deal and pre-soaking baits and leaching salt out of them and really getting that scent deal, you know, pretty much down to a science. You know, if I had been satisfied with, you know, just going out and catching whatever on Ned Rigs and stuff, I, I never would have messed with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I most certainly wouldn't be, you know, pre scenting baits and getting the salt out of them, you know, for three months. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, or uh, all that lunacy that, you know, that goes with that. Yeah. Um, Sounds like something Matt would do for sure. They're baking. Yep. <laughs> They're baking for next year. So this is, I, I mean, you watch the show. This is from the Taku, uh, yep. all the Nori's scent. And this concoction, like I hate opening it because I feel like something's leaking out. But every like couple shows, beginning of the show that we talk in, and Brad said it, he's like, dude, you always like just sneak a smell. And I do. I'll like open it and be like, and I'll do that because it's just bad. But I mean, this is going to catch fish. And these are some, some, uh, uh, three inch tubes that I'm going to throw in the winter. I know it's a little big, but I'm going to throw it anyway, yep. just because they're full of scent. I'm going to see if I can get some stuff, start cranking on them. Yep. That'd be cool. Back in, uh, I think it was 2016 is when Ned and I did that. A very extensive article on Ian Fisherman about scent. Um, and I went into the whole scent, de you know, deal there. And I also spoke about it on Smallmouth Crush mm -hmm. with Travis Manson uh, in pretty great detail. Um, I really didn't think a lot about it, you know, heck, that seven years ago now that I was doing that. Um, because I was like, well, heck, probably everyone's doing this and they're just not talking about it and this and that and the other. But, you know, I... I if I had a dime for every email that I got regarding Procure Sense and what I do with, uh, you know, pre-soaking baits, I'd be retired right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, and, uh, you know, and I, I love teaching guys and walking them through how to do it. But um, my scent deal has come a long ways in seven years. Um, but I, I will guarantee you this, that uh, any of my soft plastics that I throw, uh, the, you know, they're, they're sitting for months. Um, yeah, I, I've got a uh, well, in both oil based and water soluble, um, it, you know, there's a massive difference there. It, you know, it, it's not just uh, uh, it's not just uh, taking baits and you know, lathering them up in some kind of mystery goo and letting them set and thinking it's it's good because there are a lot of uh, hours that I you know, that I spent, you know, to get it right. And, yeah. Uh, water soluble. And uh, I, I don't think a lot of people uh, venture into that, but, you know, it, it's important. It, it's, it's a major player. Um, I, I, sure. I, I guarantee if I, I go out, you know, a drop shot, you know, a shad shaped worm, it's probably sitting for, about three months and water soluble. Yeah. Procure shrimp. Um, the difference between the water soluble and the oil base. Now, if you're relying on a, uh, you know, a salt infused bait that you want to use weightless, you want to use the oil um, because you don't want to leach that salt out, you know, mm -hmm. which will throw the drops off. Um, so there's a lot to know about it. You know, there really is. Um, and, and I guarantee you, Taku, he, he went through a lot of experimentation before, you know, he arrived at his formula that, that he uses on that. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. This... And, uh, you know, as did I. Uh, I I had a, uh, a custom Procure uh, blend that is still available through Procure. And the reason I bring that up 
is uh, everything that I, you know, had back in uh, 2016 made up as a custom, you know, is now available. Heck, you can just buy it right on Tackle Warehouse, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially. You know, uh, back 2016, heck, it was, you know, state of the art. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's here we are, it, yep. you know, it's out. So, um, <laughs> I'm always amazed, uh, you know, the next, next best thing. And I'm really in tune with that. And, um, um, I don't know what it'll be in the small mouth world, but I mean, it's always fun, you know, to keep an eye out. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, this would be a great, another great show if you're willing to come back on and just talk since we, we've been trying to find somebody to do that. So it'd be cool to have you back on for that. Yes. Guys, I, I would, uh, I'll talk your ear off on it. <laughs> That's perfect. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you everything that I've went through with it and what baits and, yeah. uh, you know, the cure times and, um, I'm a big, big believer in it, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, none of my baits get thrown without it. And, uh, you know, my wife's the same way. And thank God my wife is my favorite fishing partner. And she loves smallie fishing. And uh, <laughs> and, um, and uh, she's the same way. She's like, I think I need scent on there. You know, and uh, I've kind of created a monster with it. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it, it does make a difference um yeah. i would love to be able to film uh wintering fish for you guys um on a bait two identical baits same rod and reel same line same everything mm-hmm. one being scented and one not that'd be cool yeah it'd be awesome it, that would be it sick. Is, um it's eye-opening Huh, that's interesting. It, it, it really is. Um, and I'll get, I'll, uh, I'll kind of go down this this rabbit hole a little bit, but, um, you know, in the summer, everybody and their brother likes to throw a whopper plopper, and you know, and yeah, of course the swim bait things coming on, you know, um. But I, I'm going to tell you, in the summertime, when you get those uh, bathwater temps and you've got big fish on shade lines and stuff like that that you see cruising and they won't hit anything for nothing, mm-hmm. um, it, you can winter fish. You can catch those fish. Some of the best, uh, some of the best summer fishermen that I know in tough conditions can winter fish. Makes sense. So you know that finesse that uh, finesse game isn't just for winter. Yeah, I, oh, I yeah. guarantee you. You know, believe um, me, me and Brad have uh, thrown quite a few neds in the middle of July. Yeah, <laughs> right. where we don't want to, and I, I, I keep, yeah. I throw a ned, and I just stare at my jackhammer sitting there saying yep. i wish they'd just bite you <laughs> or i'm staring at a big swim bait right. or you know something saying i just want them to eat that but no they'll just eat a two and a half inch dead rig right. that's all black and is boring so yep. yeah <laughs> well oh man this has been an awesome packed show and we, oh, we don't yeah. we don't want to keep you too long here but uh no, whatever you got i'm <laughs> do you uh what? do you have uh any 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 shout outs or anywhere you can let people know or they can follow you and uh, if you send us the link to your articles we can post that in the show notes yep uh, yep right on uh you know um i, I think a couple years back unfortunately uh the in fisherman midwest finesse site uh you know in fisherman pulled the plug on that unfortunately mm. and um but I, I, I had the great pleasure of getting to know Ned Katie from those, and uh, you know we're still in touch, and uh, those articles are still on there, and they're, in my humble opinion, they're they're just phenomenal, you know, finesse articles, and mm-hmm. uh, I think they would help, you know, a lot of guys, um, you know, I, I mean. I'm certainly blessed to have some really good sponsors. Um, and, 
I, I can guarantee you that I would not have any sponsors and I wouldn't buy their products out of my own pocket. And that's how I got to know them. That's yeah. how I roll. Uh, if I'm not going to, you know, be buying stuff, I don't, I don't want anything to do with them. And customer service goes a long ways as well. Um, yeah. You know, if I can't get a return email on a, a three thousand dollar purchase. I don't want anything to do with the company. That's that's oh, me being sure. blunt. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just uh, I sent you know a couple emails out this week, and I'm like you know looking at a pretty substantial purchase, and I can't even get a return, you know, phone call. I'm like, what are you going to be like after the after the sales over? You know? Yeah. It, 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 like that's me. That's uh. Being in the, uh, you know, in this thing for a lot of years, uh, you know, that just kind of twists me the wrong way, unfortunately. So, yeah. Um, oh, for sure. You know, I, I'm, of course, I'm with, uh, you know, Jackson Kayak. I'm very blessed to be with them. Uh, I've been in Jackson's from the day they came off, you know, the first first ones came out. And, uh, um, uh, and I love them. I, I run two uh, two Jacksons, the Take Two and the the Cusax. Nice. Um, yeah. And I've been with Sims for probably fifteen to twenty years. Um, you know, so th these are companies I've been with for, you know, uh, of course, uh, Pro Cure. Been with them for quite a while. Um. And probably Matt's not going to like this, but I want, I'm going to thank Daiwa. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, hey, I will say, you see all the Shimano boxes in the corner? Well, you might. I mean, I just, I've knocked it down. But this has been one of my favorite reels of the year is a Zillion SVTWG. It's been one of my favorite rides. It's super smooth. It reminds me of, a, a, you might not like this, but it reminds me a lot of a Shimano Bantam. It's a yeah. really nice reel. It's it's just nice. And I have that on a Nori's rod. It's my like super Japanese combo. And that's uh, a cool combo. It I'm I'm big fan. Of, I mean, I I don't like Dio American stuff. I just don't. I'm sorry. I just I just don't. But they're Japanese stuff. Me and Chitwood, we always argue all the time about Dio and Shimano and all this stuff. But even he agrees, he's like, Dio's Japanese stuff is better. I like their Japanese stuff. I just am a fangirl for Shimano and Mega Bass. I just am. It is what it is. So, yeah, it, you know, uh, we're we're most certainly very, very, very lucky. Um, you can probably guess going back 35, 40, you know, 40 plus years uh, of this thing. Uh, how far this stuff has come is just absolutely phenomenal. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, oh, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. From back I mean, then. The te technology of fishing uh, I mean, is, is it, exploded. It, it just blows you away. I mean, it really does. Um, you know, we're fishing reels right now. You know, heck, a $200 reel right now is better than anything that existed, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you know it is it, for it's sure. It, and there's so many, you know, Ford versus Chevy, you know, tackle yeah. and everything. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I get that. It, you know, um, I, I will tell you this, guys. I uh, I ran uh, probably anywhere from eight to ten NRX with Stellas and Accents on them for for eons. Yeah, um, you know. Um, it's nice to have choices. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for know. sure. Yeah, it really and uh, um, I've I've got some pretty good friends in the industry that uh that have remained with me through the years, and you know, um, American Legacy, you know, tackle, uh, you know the. They've treated me right for years. I, I've, I've been with them for almost nine years now, ten years. I think about a decade. Mm -hmm. um, Brian Dolney at uh, American Legacy has hooked me up really, really well over the years, and I'm not easy on tackle. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, is river anglers worth 
by baby and our stuff, you know. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's it's def they're definitely tools. That's how I look at them. They're yeah. tools. I beat yep. the crap. It just like just like I mean, I looked at my M4 or anything else. It was a tool. I beat the crap out of it. And it's what you have it for. So. Yep, all my pretty uh, reels are all scratched up too. So it's whatever. <laughs> yeah, two of my reels are missing clutch buttons, and I just keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the the river is definitely unforgiving on uh, on the, the Rolex watches in the tackle world. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. it's uh, it's it's not nice. I was gonna grab my Antares over there in the pile of rods, but it it looks like it went through the meat grinder. So <laughs> yeah, but hey, you know, whatever, it still works. I don't care. So that's yeah, why I have the boxes. Good. They look they look nice. They can stay nice, right. and I'll just beat yeah. the crap that comes out of them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but, all right, Travis, man, we really appreciate you being on. Um, definitely going to have to have you come back and talk about scent. I mean, that's going to be a whole other episode by itself. Sure. And Because uh, me and Brad have been talking about it. We've talked about it 10 times on shows, but yep. really appreciate you coming on. We've got a lot of good info to go on. I know our listeners are going to have a lot of good info to go on. Guys, thanks for sticking with us through the whole show. If you have any questions, feel free, like always, reach out to Brad, myself, and I'm sure Travis will answer any and every question you ever have about fall, winter transition, what to do. Um, and, yeah, appreciate it yet again. Another week, another week closer to Christmas for everyone out there who <laughs> likes Christmas, because I do, because I get new fishing crap. <laughs> All right, guys, that is the end of the episode. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next week.